Yep, sit back, relax, and get ready to enjoy another awesome video by Captain Franklin Air. Please subscribe, like, and share with all your friends and all the people you hate, too. Hi, I'm Captain Franklin Air, a retired Coast Guard officer and SAM's accredited Marine Surveyor with over 40 years of experience in the maritime and diving industry. I've amassed literally thousands of photos of all the bad things I've found on boats during my career as a Marine Surveyor. So what we're going to do today is take a look at some of my favorites. We're going to take a look at each picture. We're going to discuss why they're evil. Evil! And we're going to discuss what you need to do to correct them. So hop in, buckle up, keep your arms and legs inside the car at all times as we take a carnival-like ride tour through the cavalcade of owner-induced perversions that I like to call Captain Frank's Sea Chest of Horror. Sea Chest of Horror. The owner of this vessel decided a diesel heater was just a ticket for those cold winter days. But what to do about a fuel supply? While utilizing the boat's primary fuel tank seemed a reasonable option, a simpler solution, or so his logic went, was just to recycle a used plastic jug and create a separate but in no way equal mini fuel tank. Drill a small hole in the jug cap, insert the heater fuel supply line, zip tie it all together, and viola. It goes without saying, although this photo proves it has to be said anyway. An impromptu fuel tank installation such as this does not meet any installation or safety standard known to man, and it is not the proper option that should be used. So I see this kind of stuff uh, all the time. This is a a portable gas generator that the owner has, uh, you know, he's installed it, quasi installed it in his uh, boat. You know, it's it's summer, it's 100 degrees, it's Africa hot outside, and Ethel, she wants that air conditioner going. We're away from the dock and it's hot. You know, what's a man going to do? Well, he, uh, you know, he can't afford a permanently installed marine generator. These things you can buy down at the... Uh, you know, the big buck store for, you know, probably a quarter of the price of a real marine generator. So the economic uh, driver is pretty high here, but that doesn't mean that it's safe or what you should do. There's a number of regulations that apply to permanently installed gasoline engines on boats, particularly with regards to stuff like fuel systems, electrical systems, and ventilation. The permanently installed generators and gasoline engines in general have to meet these to be safe. A portable generator like this meets none of them. They're rarely, if ever, uh, ignition protected, meaning they can uh, produce a spark that, if gasoline fumes are present, could ignite the fumes and cause an explosion of biblical proportions. Another issue would be the fuel system on a portable generator. Uh, it doesn't meet the requirements for hoses and fuel fittings uh, that a permanently installed generator must meet. This situation creates a real potential for fire should a leak develop. Also, if there was a fire from another source, hoses and fittings for a portable generator don't meet the burn time requirements. Uh, that's resistance to failure during a fire. That a permanently installed generator, uh, the components for that fuel system must meet. Uh, and don't get me started about the potential hazards of uh, filling a hot portable generator on board. As bad as all these are, the worst issue from a safety standpoint, in my view, is the problem with exhaust and carbon monoxide poisoning. Deaths occur due to this every year, even with the permanently installed generators, due to lack of maintenance or improper use. The chances of this are 100 times worse with a portable generator. I've seen boat owners install portable units at every location you can imagine, uh, trying to justify that it's safe. At the bow, at the stern, the cockpit. I even had one dude install it in the forward cabin of his trawler. You know, we, we just opened the hatch a crack to get that fresh air in here. You know, no matter where you place them on board, the potential for exhaust to find its way into the vessel exists. The best life-saving advice I can offer is just don't use them. So what we're looking at here, the issue is if you look at the prop and you look at the propeller shaft and you look at the stern tube, uh, the distance between the stern tube and the propeller hub, uh, it just it's excessive, right? Uh, typically, the link between the propeller and the stern tube, uh, the generally accepted distance between them is probably going to be uh, about one shaft diameter, one and a half at the most. In this particular instance, the shaft is about a, 
it's an inch and a quarter in diameter, while the distance between the propeller and the stern tube is uh, over four inches. So how did we get here? What's causing this? Well, the owner, after I pointed it out to him, said, well, you know, um, <clears throat> I bought this shaft. I got a good deal on it. It was a little longer, and I didn't think it would be a problem. So he used it, and he put it in, and this is what we have. But wait, there's more, and it gets even better. When he was installing this, if you take a look at it, he cut the stern tube, he cut about an, you know, it's probably about a, a half, a half an inch, three quarter inch off the end of the stern tube. But when he put the cutlass bearing in there and he tightened it with the Allen screws or set screws to the right hand side, he had probably a, the half inch of a cutlass bearing sticking out. So he just put the cut off part of the stern tube onto the cutlass bearing and tighten it down with that one you know set screw it's not doing anything it's just sitting there on the uh cutlass bearing which means that it's certainly not providing any additional support so that's another issue with this installation that should be addressed so here's a photo that proves that you know what boaters they're funny people they can do some funny stuff and they can justify doing it in their own mind, particularly when it's an easy solution to a uh, potentially, you know, pain in the butt problem. Well, this is nothing really major here. You got a typical leaky stuffing box and the owner has, you know, it's leaking, it's putting water in his builds, and he don't like it. So what we do is we put a, a aluminum pan underneath it and you know what? Uh, it, it'll fill up with water and it, we're getting so lazy, right? We don't even want to have to empty it as often as, you know, we should. So we're going to put a big sponge in there, which will increase our distance or time between uh, emptying the pans. So rather than just, you know, pulling the boat and repacking the stuffing box, this is the dance we're doing to try to avoid doing what should be done. This is our solution right here. And as you can see by the corrosion and the salt build up on the shaft and, and the vertigris on the uh, stuffing box, this is not something that's just been happening in a, you know, a couple of weeks. It's been that way for years. And redneck ingenuity aside, you know, you got a boat that's constantly leaking, you know, that could lead to sinking as well, right? You know, the water comes in, the bilge pump fails, battery dies, whatever, and next thing you know, your boat's sunk. So the recommendation here, of course, is clear the shaft and the stuffing box of salt and corrosion and crud, and you know what? Pull the boat, repack the stuffing box, and make what ought to be what is.